My name's Eric Shaw, and um, uh, uh, my family and I have been going here for about four years. We're in a bit of a long uh, transition in ministry. I'm an ordained uh, pastor with the Assemblies, and I've uh, been uh, hanging out here, helping out, and I uh, uh, was called uh, by Pastor Kevin uh, earlier this week to, to come and speak. We don't, I'm so glad he did, because he needed the time this week to focus on family. Amen? Amen. Gotta take care of your family. So, and I know that uh, he's grateful for all the people that help carry the burden around here, and we're praying for him this week. So, uh, anyway, um, in honor of the Stetses, right? We're sending them off tonight, and uh, so, uh, gotta, you know, what's the best thing about Switzerland? I don't know, but their flag is a big plus. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Shake it off until God shakes it out, right? Okay. Um, so uh, today we're going to be launching a new series in the book of Acts and, uh, uh, called uh, Called Out. So I'm going to be getting into a little bit of the background with you. Uh, you can go ahead and find Acts chapter 1 in your Bibles if you'd like. Uh, in a moment, I'll have you stand. We're going to read the... Uh, the, uh, the theme verse for the series in just a moment together. But uh, we recently finished a series in Haggai uh, where the concentration was on the fact that God is with us and what that means in our lives. Uh, it was about rebuilding a broken temple where the presence of God would dwell with his people. Acts is about the construction of the new and final place where God's presence would dwell yes. in the hearts and lives of his people who believe in his son. So uh, would you stand with me? We're going to read uh, uh, Acts 1.8. And can we read it together? We're going to put it on the screen for you. We need one of those bouncing balls. Remember those kids shows? Like, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's read that together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You may be seated. Thank you. Acts is about the birth of the church. Uh, now, some of you with your background, you may believe that I'm referring to an institution, uh, perhaps a rigid hierarchy, and lots and lots of fancy robes and hats. Um, what I'm actually talking about is the called out ones, the, the ecclesia of God, the, the assembly, the, God's people, the people of God who share the common bond of the Spirit wherever they may be in this world and in whatever culture they may be in. Now, I've been blessed to travel a bit, and uh, I'm always kind of amazed. I shouldn't be, but I'm always amazed, like, whether it's, you know, been in Australia, England, or, or many places in the Philippines, even the remote places where you connect with God's people. Maybe it's in a, a, a church that's meeting in a hut or whatever, but it's the same spirit there yes. that it is here. And it's just mind-blowing because it shouldn't be, again, it shouldn't be, because God is so much bigger than the American church, than our experience of him, but he's the same everywhere. It's great. And so Acts, Acts is a book that's filled with heartache, it's filled with trials, it's filled with confusion and victories and defeats, miracles and power, you know, life. It's filled with life. And through it all, we see God working out His will through the imperfect actions of His people. The book shows that the Christian life is, is, is one following the will of God. Now, there's a great picture to, to help you picture this. Um, following the will of God in this life is like our lives on a, on a train, uh, as a train on two tracks. And one track is the sovereignty of God, and one track is our free will. And both of those God uses us to get us to our destination. Now, if we lean too far in one direction or the other, our train derails, right? But God's grace is there to catch us and put us back on track, which is where that phrase comes from, by the way. So, you know, the verse that we just read together actually serves as a rough outline for the book of Acts. Chapters 1 through 7, the church is in Jerusalem. Uh, chapters 8 through 12, spreading to Judea and Samaria, 
And then in verses, or chapters 13 through 26, to the ends of the known earth where the church reaches Rome, where the gospel reaches Rome, which was the center of the known world through which influence would come. So uh, now Acts covers a period of about 30 years, starting at the resurrection and then it abruptly finishes in AD 62. It's within the living generation of the people who saw and experienced the ministry of Jesus. You might say, so what? Well, uh, you know, Luke not only uses the Gospel of Mark, which was written shortly before that, but he would have been able to interview the people whose stories he's telling and compiling. Why is that a big deal? Listen, people are confused these days. They don't know if anything is trustworthy. They don't know uh, who to trust, what to trust. That There's been lies. There's been disappointment. But listen, God's word is trustworthy. You see, we still use the eyewitness account in our courts of law today. There's power there. There's authority there in the eyewitness. And so what the stories that we're reading are from eyewitnesses who were alive to see these events transpiring. It's, it's great. And listen, people have questions. Now listen, don't, don't waste your time on mockers. There's lots of people mocking everything these days. Don't, don't waste your time. But for people who have questions, it's good for you to know and grow in your, in your understanding and knowledge of Scripture and even how Scripture was developed, right? Because God wants to use you, right? Amen, Pastor Eric. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I will totally amen myself. I, will, I am not ashamed. I will do it. So uh, the, the gospel, Luke's gospel dovetails into the book of Acts, and Acts is addressed to Theophilus, which literally means lover of God. Now, you know, this is where theologians get their kicks about speculation. Uh, it, it could be a general term. Uh, you know, some people say that it's a general term addressed to the church, lovers of God. Uh, personally, just my opinion, okay, take it or leave it, uh, I think it's a wealthy patron who was a new convert, and perhaps he took on a new name as was common, you know, Saul to Paul, Simon to Peter, etc., to signify his new life in Christ. There you go. That's my thoughts on it. Uh, prove me wrong if you want. Uh, Acts is a great book. It begins to explore the continuing work of Jesus in this world through his people. It's continuing work. Right. Jesus' work didn't end when he went up into heaven. That's right. It's continuing through his people. You. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. I didn't have to amen myself. Thank you for that. Uh, so, you know, Pastor Crow is going to be camping out here the next few months and exploring what it means to be a New Testament church. You know, we're taking this new step, uh, a new chapter in the church and the building program and so on. That's it's fantastic, but it's never about the building. Amen. That's right. right? You've heard him say that clearly. It's never about the building. It's about the people. It's about the ministry. It's about Jesus continuing mission, working in and through us. So, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to dive in, all right? Let's pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you please bring us Jesus in this place today? God, I don't want to play church or religious games. I don't want any of that stuff. I just want Jesus. Would you please shine a really big light on Jesus, and would you please open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say? Not, help us to hear your words not the words that we often make up and place in your mouth, hoping to hear those from you, but, but actually what you want to say to us. Uh, God, we give you ourselves and our attention and our hearts this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. There it is. Okay. We're going to go ahead and read. Oh, go ahead and stand up. Some of you look like you need some exercise anyway. So, <coughs> I was looking in the mirror. Don't get offended. All right, so we're going to start uh, uh, in Acts chapter 1. It said, in, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions, and instructions, by the way, is a weak uh, translated as commands, uh, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, 
He was eating with them, and he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, <clears throat> excuse me, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid uh, him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. So, the disciples, they have the commands, they have the gospel, they have, they've seen amazing things the last few months and even the last few years. Jesus has gone into heaven, but one of the final emphatic commands from the Lord is to wait. Why wait? In verses 4 through 5, on one occasion, he was eating with them, he gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Listen, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. That's true. Right? As much as we would like to force God's hand and hurry it up, he has a plan and he has a time frame. Have you run into issues with God's timing in your life? Perhaps. I have big problems with that. I'm just saying. I mean, we, we talk all the time. Okay, it's not really talking, it's more whining, you know, and, and it mostly sounds like teenage girls, you know, how they put an extra syllable when they're, they're whining, uh, why, uh, no, uh, what's that extra syllable about? That's how my prayers sound, I don't know about you. Help, uh, okay, so, uh, <laughs> Y'all need to pray for me. I have issues. So. so, you know, when reading Acts and the rest of the Bible, we need to remember that we know, we know the end of the stories, right? We know what's coming on the next page, at least if you, you know, paid attention. We don't feel the tension that they felt while living it out. You know, they, they're going through this, and they don't know what's on the next page. And, you know, we know it's coming. We also need to realize that, that what we're reading are highlights that often span years, right? I mean, Paul in these different cities he goes to, and he's, he's making tents, right? He's like, okay, just got to keep making these tents, you know. Silas, you think this is ever going to work out? I don't know. Just keep making tents. We'll, we'll keep trying, you know. We just, let's just keep going, keep going, keep going. And we know the great ending of all these stories, you know. Remember that one place they'd start throwing rocks at us? You know, but we, they didn't know. They were just living it out. That's important for you to realize. Because, right, we're living it out, and we don't get to see the end of our stories yet. So why the command to wait? Well, if they had begun to act on their own, it would have been premature and would have failed. God was lining things up with the Feast of Weeks, which was Pentecost, when the Jews from all over the known world would be traveling to Jerusalem how, listen, how are most mountains, you know, we just sing the song about mountains being moved. How are most mountains in our lives moved? One stone at a time. Right. One day at a time. Right. We just keep walking. The faith comes in, uh, in, in continuing to move stones Amen. so that those, th that mountain is eventually removed. Listen, there's times where God breaks through and that mountain goes sailing all of a sudden and we get to whoo! little Pentecost party, you know. But most of the mountains in our lives are removed one stone at a time. So how did the Roman Empire mountain move? One life at a time. One step at a time. Normal people, listen, the, the disciples and the apostles, I, I don't want to take anything away from them and their acts and, and the, the evangelism, evangelism they did, but the, if, you, if you do the studying and the history 
the gospel really was spread mostly by normal people traveling on the roads, taking their story of hope, what they had found, and sharing it with other people. Mm -hmm. On the marketplace, in the workplace, uh, slaves sharing the gospel with owners and the household getting saved. That's how the Roman Empire eventually toppled and was taken for Christ. Oh, you're not getting it. That's too good. Huh? Man, that's good. Preacher, preacher. Okay, thank you. So uh, people just sharing the hope that they'd found. Well, so continuing in our passage, Jesus gets, his, gets their attention when he mentions the word power, right? But you shall receive power. And they're like, huh? You've got, I'm listening, Jesus. You're going to give me some power? And then in verses uh, 7 through 8, after saying that they're going to receive power, we read this. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the, the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. You know, it still irks me when I, when I hear the, the apostles uh, referred to as like St. Peter, St. John, St. whatever, St. Matthew. You know, the, these little ver it, it's, it's it, it buys into a, a, a bad way of thinking and that making them into something other than being who they were, which was human beings. And so, and it just puts them in this superhero context. But, and that's not taking away anything from them. But, you know, these little verses right here not only serve as further evidence of the authenticity and reliability of Scripture because, you know, they're not trying to make themselves look good by leaving this part out. Right? I mean, if I was writing, I'd be like, man, I was stupid there. I'm not putting that in there. <laughs> Right? I don't want to look dumb. <laughs> I mean, sometimes that happens anyway. But, uh, but it also reminds me of one thing. These guys were just a bunch of chuckleheads like you and me. Yeah, that's right. Do you know that? The only position and authority they have, and they do have, and they have this unique place in the church and history and the, even in the coming kingdom... But it's all given by grace. Yes. The same thing that everything that we have is given to us by is grace. Yeah, amen. All throughout the gospel narrative, these guys are talking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And, you know, I'm going to sit at Jesus' right hand. No, I am. I'm better than you. Jesus, who's the greatest? Like, would you guys shut up? <laughs> Right here, Jesus is telling them they're going to be receiving a wonderful and powerful gift, and they are immediately back in their old frame of mind. Is it time to kick the Romans out now? Are we, we're going to restore national pride. Make Israel great again. Jesus, we printed shirts and hats and everything. <laughs> yeah, I went there. I did. But Jesus' response to them is great. It's just great. The, pa the patience of Jesus. He just says, you don't get to know that answer. Have you been there? I have. Jesus, is it time yet? Jesus, you, you promised breakthrough. Is it, is it now? You don't get to know that. Why? Uh... <laughs> you don't get to peek at the blueprint for your life. Amen. You don't get to see the timeline of events that's going to happen. Jesus says, you just have to keep trusting me through it all. Amen. Every single one at a time step, you need to just trust me. Trust my heart, even when you don't see my hand. Trust me. But something, he's saying to them, something is coming that is going to change everything. <clears throat> you know, we just finished uh, the series where the, the main theme was, I am with you. And, and, and you know, Jesus is saying, you know, I, I told you in the past that I'm with you, but I'm about to do something that you never dreamed and restore what was lost. What was lost? Eden, paradise, the place where we walked in perfect fellowship with our God, perfect relationship. God is restoring all that was broken. 
And, you know, it's no longer prophets only. You see, in the Old Testament, there were special groups of people, prophets, priests, uh, you know, scribes, etc., that, you know, there was a special place to go where God's presence dwelt. There were special people. A time is coming, he's saying, I'm going to send the Spirit of God and all of you. The Spirit of God will be dwelling in all of you. All of you. That's huge. And they, don't, they didn't get that. So what you're saying is we get to kick out Romans? Okay, they just didn't see the greater things. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The plan is much bigger than what you realize. Some, you know, much big, the plans are, are, are much bigger than one nation. Listen, I'm as concerned as you are about our nation and what's going on, but God's kingdom will last. Hallelujah. It's eternal, and God is on the throne. And he's inviting, he was inviting them, and he invites us to be a part of turning the world upside down for his kingdom. Just because God calls us to be faithful in the little things, we think that's all he's interested in and all he's doing in our lives. Because we don't see the bigger things that he's up to. And he's able to work the bigger things through our faithfulness in the little things. You think it doesn't matter. All you see is these little things. You're just trying to be faithful. But God is doing bigger things through those. Don't despise the small things. The glory of God is often revealed in the small acts of faithful obedience. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's go. continue on. Uh, verses 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid, the, hid uh, him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Now, it is a great idea when you're reading scripture to, to put yourself in the story. You know, how, you know, the first hearers of the words, how were they hearing it? What were they thinking at the time? And just trying to imagine yourself in that situation. And so... Uh, you know, put yourself in the scripture, and in all honesty, uh, I put myself into this passage in this moment when the angels appeared, and they say, why do you stand here looking into the sky? I might have been like, um, you know, Jesus just took off like Superman, and maybe that's not a big deal for you guys, <laughs> but we don't really see things like that around here too much. I mean, maybe he wants to do some loop-de-loops, or you know, do some laps up there. I don't know. That's why I'm staring. That's why angels don't talk to me, y'all. <laughs> I would be struck, struck mute or something. Something bad would happen. It's probably a grace that they don't appear. But right, I mean, Jesus took. Okay. Anyway, I bet. Is he going to come back now? Okay. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, this same Jesus who's been taken up. Uh, taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So they're asking, why are you standing here? What a, that's a great question. Why are you standing here? You know, one of the most helpful things in my life that has helped me choose to do what's right, uh, even when I don't want to, is to ask a simple question. Why wouldn't you? And I often don't like the answer that I give. Well, you're selfish. You're, you're being lazy. That's why you wouldn't do it. Okay. I mean, you know, and then you, you choose to do what's right if you're, if you're honest with yourself and you don't lie to yourself. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's a great question. That, uh, there, there's power in questions, right? There's a great question that's why. You should ask that all the time. Not from a cynic's point of view or mocking or anything, but, but why? So why are you standing here, they say, you know what to do. You've been given directions. Jesus will return the same way he just left, but not before you get busy being the church. Amen. There's stuff to do. Why are you standing here? Right. You know the next step, but you haven't moved. You've had some moments with Jesus. 
you want to camp out here and maybe make a little memorial to this moment, you, but you've been given your marching orders and you're still standing here. You know, these men, the disciples, were carrying the seed of the kingdom within them, but were staring at the sky, stuck in a moment when they needed to get their eyes on the mission which was all around them. Now listen, a couple months ago, I started a new job, and uh, it's, at the, it's at a high school, it's at Berea High School, and uh, it's a part-time job, allows me to keep my family stuff uh, first and, and uh, help bring in a little bit. So I'm not there uh, the whole day, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, this generation's in trouble, y'all. I mean, for real. And this is even one of the better high schools. But before, every morning before I walk in the building, I, I just, I'm, I'm at a desperate moment. I, I'm, I'm praying and begging God, say, God... Would you please fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you give me strength I don't have? Because every day I come home exhausted because of all the brokenness that's there. And it's, it's, it's crazy. And so I'm, I'm, I'm begging Jesus, God, would you send me in there as an agent of your kingdom, bringing the kingdom with me, and in some small moments here and there, would you help me to establish that kingdom just please help me. Now, school lets out at the end of uh, next month. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to get fired before then. <laughs> For one of two reasons. <laughs> one is, uh, you know, I, that I, one of the reasons I might get fired is, is for taking my belt off and giving these boys what their dad should have at home. You think I'm kidding. You, you see the, the, the cussed at, lied to, disrespect all the time, and, and they're just begging for the boundaries that parents provide and discipline. and You know, fired or wind up in jail, I don't know. But, but. And the other reason that I might get fired is because I'm sharing the gospel with these teenagers every stinking day, and I don't even care. They tend to frown on that these days, if you didn't know. But, uh, you know, I talk to them. They're sharing me, with me their stories. And uh, just the broken, hey, Seuss, I just pointed you out. How you doing? He's one of the administrators at the school. <laughs> you know, you invite people to church, and you think, ah, eh, they're not going to come. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Listen, he's a great guy. I mean, for real. <laughs> you know, I, I know it bugs him, too, the stuff there, because he, he cares about these kids. Right. And uh, it's so difficult seeing the brokenness and having your hands tied because of the, the monkeys in Washington tying your hands on different things. And our, our teachers and educators and, and administrators are being made powerless to really do anything. They're, they're, they're being made slaves to policies and procedures. And Listen, if the kid knows right and wrong, then there should be discipline. So anyway, uh, so these kids are sharing their stories with me, and, you know, and, and they ask me, you know, and I, we, it's conversation, whatever, and they ask me about, you know, my stuff, you know, how long you've been married? Uh, 21 years or so. What? Really? What? Really? And they say, well, how do you do that? I'm like, you really want to know? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, Jesus. And you know, whenever you start talking to somebody about Jesus, they always start talking to you about religion and church and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Jesus. A relationship with Jesus where you're born again and you surrender your life and and, you know, when my wife and I want to blow apart and when we're fighting, Jesus is the gravitational pull that pulls us back together and we forgive each other and make... And they just kind of stare. 
But you know what? They stare longingly because they wish they had that in their lives. So, uh, I don't even know what time it is. Okay. We need to wrap this thing up. Uh, band, why don't you come on up? I'm going to go ahead and start closing, if you would. But listen, what's the next step? Not talking about directionless activity. Uh, you know, I already mentioned the next step, step was to go and wait. You know, Pastor Crow gave a great message a few weeks ago about asking us to think about the next step that God was leading us into. Sometimes the answer to that, the next step, is to go and wait on the Lord. Though more often than not, it's simply to do what he's already told you to do and stop stalling. But waiting on the Lord is not inactivity. It might look like that to people in your life, but waiting on the Lord, you are positioning yourselves according to his purpose. It's the action of placing ourselves in line with what he has spoken. It is a pause filled with potential, but it is often painful. Because two of the main ways God brings change into our lives are pain and waiting. Because he's at work. He's at work. He's at work. So listen, back to the question. Why are you standing here? Why don't you all stand with me? Why are you standing here? Well, because you told us to. (laughs) Listen, some of you have had something happen in your life that shook you. Maybe it even broke you. You spent weeks, months, maybe even years just standing there staring at it, wishing it would go away, wishing stuck in your woulda, coulda, shouldas, instead of moving on with what God has for you. Are you stuck in this life? Have you made a shrine to the past and given up on your future? You know, back in the old days, back in all these days, oh, God is still God. God is on the throne. His kingdom is advancing. Have you tried to do right and build your life the best you can only to realize you screwed it all up? You tried in your own efforts. Instead of waiting on God and surrendering your life, say, Jesus, I can't do this. I made a mess. My house I built is made with duct tape and Velcro. And every time somebody sneezes, it falls down. But Lord, I want to build my life on the rock. I want to surrender my life. I want to give it to you. God, help me. I've made a mess of things. Don't stay stuck there. Move. Take a step. Would you all bow your hearts, bow your heads with me if you would, and your hearts as well. And Just in this moment, real quick, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass anybody or anything like that, but uh, if you're here in this moment and you just want to say, Jesus, I am stuck. I desperately need you. Would, you. would you take my life and give me your own? That's the trade you're offering, and I want to take you up on it. Would you do that? If you're here and that's you, would you really quickly, with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just shoot your hand up and you put it right back down? Say, Jesus, I hear you. You're talking to me. Others quickly up and then down. Just real quick. Thank you, Lord. Secondly, I want to ask this. If you're here and you're just kind of at a place in your life where you just feel like you're in the mud and you're just not making progress and you just don't know what's going on and you just want to say, Lord, help me to change my perspective, keep my eyes on you and understand and trust you that you are at work even when I don't see it. Would you raise your hand and say, I... I just need you in this moment, Lord. I don't see things. I'm discouraged. I want to give up. But, Lord, I need you. Lord, I pray right now for those that have raised their hands, God, that you would come, Holy Spirit, the gift that was promised by the Father. You come alongside us, helper. And you would come and bring encouragement and lift us out of the miry clay and set us upon a rock. Those that lift their hands, and Lord, the other, the other needs that are going on, pray for Pastor Crow's dad as well, and just healing. And, and Lord, we just pray. We just pray. Even if it's just help, uh, Lord, just uh, we know that you're compassionate towards us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one last song that just reminds us 
of who we are and who God is, and then we'll dismiss in just a moment. But would you just enter into worship uh, in this moment?